This sporting hero came to dominance at the Seoul Olympics, winning the super heavyweight gold medal for Canada. But 11 years later, under the British flag, he would become professional boxing's undisputed world champion. Lennox Lewis was born in West Ham in London before emigrating across the Atlantic. Later, he reclaimed the country of his birth to become the first British boxer of the 20th century to be crowned heavyweight champion. He only suffered two defeats in a remarkable 44-fight professional record. Lennox, like a lot of sporting heroes, it took some time, didn't it, for you to get established and recognized as a big star? Yeah, it took a it took a long while, and uh, you know the way I looked at that is you know great men are always persecuted. So it it, it was something that uh, I realized that you know the importance of being good that people are always going to go against you, and uh, you know I, I thrived off of that. Did you feel per per persecuted? To a certain degree, by different people, but that really helped me because you know the greatest thing is to know yourself and know your worth and know what, what, you're, uh, what you're able to do and not let people affect you, especially, you know, a lot of people, especially reporters, used to give it to me all the time in the press and, you know, I, I, at one time I, I, I refused to read anybody's article unless it was a good article, so I just treated it like that. I would ask my friends, is that a good article? Nah, 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 then I would just throw it, throw it away or rip it up. Is it a good article? Yeah, okay, I gotta hear what this person's saying and I read about it and I start read good things about myself. Do you think there was a bit of neg negativity when you, when you turned professional about the fact that you were here till you were 12, you were born right. in, in East London, and then you went to Canada right. uh, and you won an Olympic gold medal uh, as a Canadian, and then you came back here to turn professional and call yourself British again. Well, did that cause problems for you, do you think? Big problems, big problems actually on both sides. You know, I, you know, I always told people, you know, Britain is my mother and Canada is a country that nurtured me. And, uh, you know, even if I would tell them, yo, I was born in England, raised in Canada, and they don't have a professional uh, system over there for boxing, Britain has a better system than, uh, than Canada. I didn't want to get lost in the shuffle with Don Kings and the Tyson and the Holyfields in America, so I came back to a, Brit uh, to a place where I was born, Britain, we're a country that loves boxing, and I wanted a country behind me when I, when I went into my professional boxing. When you won a gold medal uh, for Canada, and then you turned professional in Britain, did the Canadians turn against you at all? <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, when I'm, when I'm over there, they say I sound English. When I come over here to England, they say I sound American, so I can never win. And I always say I have a mid-Atlantic accent. <laughs> was your amateur career extended to make you a better boxer or to win that gold medal? It was to make me a better boxer, plus I was still young at the time, uh, 17. And uh, I was still in school. And I was so close to winning the gold medal, you know. Uh, quarterfinals. Yeah, it was the quarterfinals. If I had a better draw, I would have actually been a silver medalist. Um, I was 84 in LA against yeah, uh, you lost Ty to Tyrell Biggs. Tyrell Biggs. Biggs. And at the time, I was world junior champion at the yeah. time. Uh, and uh, didn't have that much world experience. I realized uh, Tyrell Biggs had a lot of world experience. At that time, he was going over to Russia, all these different Eastern Bloc countries to get gain that experience. And I still was raw and um, still learning the trade of being a great amateur. And I was actually put in with him, and I realized that you know what it was. It was just the the fact that he had more uh, competition than I had did, and knew what to do at that, that point. But I was definitely stronger than him, but just raw talent. But if we throw forward to Seoul in '88, you do win a gold medal, and you knock out Riddick Bo. Yeah, that was a, that was a. I call it night and day. It was interesting because while we're in the Olympic Village and everything, you know. You heard from a lot of the American team, like, yo, you know, they were coming up to me wishing me good luck. And I was like, the American team is wishing me good luck. They want me to uh, beat their heavyweight. And, you know, his name's Riddick Bowen. He's kind of like mouthy and he's pretending he's Muhammad Ali and they don't like him. So I said, don't worry, I'm going to knock him out. So uh, going into the fight, I was very focused, very confident. And I realized that this is my chance to win gold. 
and I've been here before, so I better not uh, let myself down. Went in there with uh, destruction on my mind, and I went in there and, and gave it to him. He, and what really made me give it to him, he hit me with a great uppercut. And I went back after the first round and I said, the guy blooded my nose. And that even got me more steamed. And I went out there and I just went after him. And uh, just gave it 100%. Referee stopped the fight. Uh, went on the podium. They were playing the national anthem at the time. Um, and really said, leaned over to me and said, I see you in prose. I said, OK, cool. So I always expected to see him in prose but I didn't get to see him in prose. And then when I came off of the podium, everybody started taking my picture, everybody wanted my autograph. And I was a bit paranoid too, because two guys grabbed me and said, don't touch anybody's hand, don't talk to anybody, don't drink anything. So I was like, you know, I'm not supposed to be feeling this after winning a gold medal. But then we realized why they were saying that it was because of the Ben Johnson incident. And um, it, it was kind of weird because, uh, the Canadian team at the time said, you know, everybody take off their colors. We don't want to be talking to no press. You know, everybody kind of uh, hush up about it. So it kind of got uh, thrown down a little bit. Why did you take up boxing? Why did I take up boxing? Well, yeah. the reason why I took up boxing, because uh, at the time, the place, the school I was going to, they had surrounding schools. And every month, they would have a dance at different schools. And there was one school, uh, KCI, they had their tough guys, and we were the tough guys for Cameron Heights, and uh, they wanted to fight us. So we said, OK, if you want to fight us, come down to the police boxing club and fight us, because we realized if we beat them up down there, we won't get in trouble. It's a boxing club, and the police is there and everything, so we won't get in trouble. So I went down there, waited for the guys. The guys didn't show up. Then the next month, dance happened, seen the same guys. We said, hey, you must have forgot. Make sure you're there at this time. It's the police boxing club. They said, yeah, we're going to be there. And I said, OK, good. Went down there again. They never showed up. Then all of a sudden, a trainer came up to me and said, hey, you, come. I want you to move around with this little guy. I looked over, seen the little guy. I said, little guy, OK. Put on some gloves, went in the ring. His name was Bobby Prue at the time. And let me tell you, he was good. I couldn't even hit him. Hit me in the nose. My eyes started watering. I was saying, no, nah, no, nah, this ain't for me. He said, no, 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 no. Put on the gloves again. I want you to move around with this guy. Bigger guy now. <laughs> I'm like, wow. All right. Put on the gloves. And I started doing my Muhammad Ali impression, dancing around and you know, uh, throwing out the jab. And it felt good. It felt like a game of tag. And I was excited about it. And uh, what I loved about it, I was also d doing American football in high school at the time. And we were really good. And we actually went all the way to the championship and lost. The reason why we lost, two guys dropped the ball. 50 guys start, start crying after that. On the bus ride home, 50 guys are crying. I'm saying, I'm not crying. It wasn't my fault. You know, it was those guys' fault. Then I realized, you know, in boxing, it's an individual sport. It really all depends on you. And even if you win or lose, you get a trophy. And I wanted to build up my trophy collection as well. And also, the coaches were. Uh, encouraging me, saying, you know, you're going to be pretty good one day. You should keep it up. So that's what really got me into boxing. How big were you then? Because um, you, you were 10 pounds, 10 ounces when you were born. You were a big baby <laughs> for your mother, Violet. Yeah. So how, how big were you then? I was, I was real, I, was, I would say skinny, tall, and lanky. I didn't really come into myself. I haven't really filled out as a, as a man yet. I was still more of a kiddish body type. But by the time you won the gold medal, you'd obviously filled out. Now, yeah. why did you decide to turn professional? And why did you decide to go with Frank Maloney? Well, you know, I, I wanted to turn professional. At that time, you know, Tyson was not really making a big uh, stink around the world in the sense that he was winning, knocking out a lot of people. And I was saying, wow, he's doing good as a professional. But, you know, I remember sparring with him, you know, after the World Junior Championships in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic in 1984 or 83. And um, I said, you know, this is my time to turn professional because I've been to two Olympics. And uh, it's important that, you know, I turn pro and have everything on my side. Frank Maloney phoned me up after meeting with different people, uh, Mickey Duff, Jarvis Astaire, 
um, uh, Don King, uh, Bob Arum, all these different people. And Frank Maloney said, don't sign with anybody. Come over here right now. Uh, uh, you know, anything you want, you can have. I was like, you mean I can write my own contract? He said, yes. I said, this is great. You know, always wanted to have my own way. And what was concerning, especially for my mother, was that I would get involved with some bad people or people would take advantage of me. But being able to write your own contract is great. So um, what I did, I came over. I said, I need this, I need that, I need that. They said, OK. And I said, this is great. Plus the fact that I wanted uh, a country behind me, uh, especially the country where I was born in, which loved boxing and, uh, you know, were behind boxing and behind um, me trying to become heavyweight champion of the world. The entry of Roger Levitt, who became a disgraced uh, financier and now lives in the States, um, had to do community service but was involved in, in uh, a lot of allegations, as you know. How did he get involved and did he rip you off in any shape or form or was he no, absolutely fair with you? No, he was very fair with me. See, I was, I'm, I'm the commodity. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of what he was doing in his business practices, but uh, all I knew is that he wanted the biggest and the best uh, sporting heroes in his, on, his, on his team. And having uh, the best amateur boxer at the time was very important for him. So, and I, and I was the best at that time. I was Olympic champion. And, um, you know, didn't, didn't see the, the, the dark side of him, but uh, I'd, I'd only seen the good side. And I remember one time going to his office and telling him if I could get a car, a BMW or something. He goes, what? Nah, man, you need a Mercedes and make sure you get some of these good wheels behind it. I was like, well, I like this guy, you know? So I only knew the good side from him. So the early days of being <coughs> professional, did you know you were going to be world champion in your own mind then? Well, my aim was to be world champion. And I looked at it like this. I said, <clears throat> you know, I'm on a road right now, and I'm trying to reach the top of that road. And I always tell people, I'm trying to reach the nipple. And along that road, there's going to be potholes. There's going to be curves. And there's going to be um, things to try and stop me. And, but I got to keep going until I reach the top. So <clears throat> how long did it take you to turn from the, your amateur ways in style and everything else to being a professional who was going to hit the big time? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, my first problem was finding a trainer. And I needed a trainer that would teach me the professional style. Because I, had the, I was the amateur champion. I had the amateur style, the jumping around style. And uh, the first trainer was John Davenport. And he always said to me, oh, you're jumping around too much. You got to stay in the pocket. You got to slide. You got to slide. And, and you got to stay in the pocket and punch it out. And I was trying that for a while. It wasn't really my style, but it really helped me to realize to stay in the pocket and know how to keep my balance. And every time I started to jump around, he used to stop the, stop the sparring and say, ah. Stop jumping around, stop jumping around. This is what you need to do. So I was with him for a while. He, he did teach me a lot. And uh, he was just part of one of my teachers on the way of being great. And then there was Pepe Carrera. I said, I wanted to box like my, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, I love Sugar Ray Leonard. I love how he boxes. So I'm going to go get his trainer. So I got his trainer. And uh, what I realized with his trainer, was tr you know, he's a good trainer, but he was more of a cheerleader. He would just say, throw that punch, throw that right hand. And I would throw that right hand. And then I would knock the guy and say, I told you it was there. I told you. I was like, yeah, this, I, I didn't see it. But he wasn't really teaching me the technical part of what I needed to learn. And it wasn't until I lost to Oliver McCall and um, Emmanuel Stewart was in uh, Oliver McCall's corner. And I said, well, you know, I still need a trainer. And uh, um, Emmanuel Stewart said, well, I'm available after this fight. I said, you're available after this fight? He said, yeah, yeah, you know, this album McCoy, and he's a madman. You know, I can't, I can't train this guy. So at that time, he came over to my side and started, you know, uh, teaching me and uh, showing me certain things that I needed to know. And I realized the difference between a coach and a trainer.
all the rest of the trainers I had, or coaches I had, were coaches. Emmanuel Stewart is a trainer. And he, teach, he taught me the technical side of boxing, which was important for me. Talk about some of those things, because they did make you a world champion in your own right eventually. One of them was, of course, your stance. Yes. And balance. Balance and the jab. Well, the jab was your huge weapon. Yeah. So what did Emmanuel do to change the jab to make it more effective? Well, what he did was show me how to get more power behind the jab, show me how to throw it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a great way so it would be uh, very useful for me. Even the right hand, he showed me how to throw that because uh, he went over the mistake I made with Oliver McCall, and the, the mistake was I really draw, brought it back before I threw it, where, he, where Oliver McCall did more of a reaction thing, and he was more fast, faster with his punches. But uh, Emmanuel sh showed me to throw it right from my chin without no indication whatsoever. So that really helped me. I, I learned a lot from Emmanuel. Would you say that Emmanuel Stewart's joining you was probably the key factor in why you became such a great champion? Oh, absolutely. Uh, he helped in the uh, tutelage of uh, Lennox Lewis. I think we, we, uh, what helped is we both understood each other as well. What he said, I was able to translate into the ring and into my boxing. I always say I was prepared for everything. You know, anything he came at me with, I was prepared for. Crying, I wasn't prepared for that. You come across as a very laid-back <laughs> guy. Did you need to be shouted at or pushed? Sometimes, it, you know, some, it, I'm laid back to a point where, you know, uh, even Manny was trying to think of different ways to motivate me. Uh, sometimes he would shout at me, you know, I'd say, you know, you can shout at me. My mother used to shout at me, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm used to that. Let's take you back to <coughs> going for the world title. You, you beat Razor Rudder in two rounds to become the official challenger for the WBC title, which is recognised, isn't it, as the best belt at WBC. Yes. And then the champion's Riddick Bowe, and he drops the belt in a trash can and says, I'm not going to fight Lewis. Yeah. You get awarded the WBC title. That wasn't the way you wanted to win it, was it? No, it wasn't the way. But I realised that Riddick Bowe was running for me. That's why I called him Chicken Bowe. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I remembered what you said when I won the gold medal, that we would meet in professionals. Now you have the opportunity to fight me and you throw the belt away. So obviously you're scared. And you know, I don't really blame it all on Riddick Bowe. Rock Newman was yeah, the cause manager. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rock Newman realized that his gravy train was going to be ended if, if I ever boxed Riddick Bowe once again. Because the professional aspect is different. Have more time and I was really put a hurting on it. So he didn't want that. So they came up with the scandal of throwing the belt away, which is a, was a disrespect to, to the people that held the belt before him, Muhammad Ali, Jack Johnson. So that belt was a, a, a important belt in all of boxing. So when he did that, he really disgraced himself. How did you feel, Lennox, and it wasn't your fault, obviously, how did you feel about being made world champion without actually having to fight, though? You know, every, every um, champion always wants to win the belt in the ring. They never wanted it to be awarded to them. So I didn't feel too good about it, but, you know, it's just a situation that uh, I, I ended up in. And you made several successful defenses, and then you had this McCall fight. Do you think, because he was such an outsider, do you think, looking back, you took that fight too lightly or did you just make one big mistake? You know, it, uh, it's a situation where you make one big mistake and, it, and the mistake was leaving yourself open and getting caught with a, with a shot. I kind of blame the referee as well. I'm thinking, you know, I'm the champion. I get knocked down in the second round. It's not like I've been through 50, uh, 10 rounds of, of hard boxing. I got knocked down. I got knocked down. I got up off my feet. They should have counted, but he counted me out. And at the end of the day, you know, it's better to live and fight another day. And then you had to wait quite a while before you got a chance to two fight. Years, two, two years. Two years. How did that feel? Chasing them around the world, different courts, trying to get him in the ring to the, to the degree where, 
you know, Don King hit him and uh, all of a sudden he had to fight me and then when he came to fight me he wasn't really prepared mentally or physically. What about the um, return fight then? That was easy, wasn't it? That was easy but uh, weird in one sense because a lot of people always stop me about it and say, hey, you know, they still remember that fight where, how did that, they always ask me, how did that feel, uh, him crying in the ring? I always say I was prepared for everything, you know, anything he came at me with, I was prepared for. Crying, I wasn't prepared for that. And I still remember uh, Manny in the corner, Emmanuel Stewart in the corner saying to me, he's saying, well, what are you doing? I said, the man's crying. This was in the fifth round, yeah, wasn't it? You man, know. <laughs> man's crying, what do you want me to do? He said, well, if he doesn't want to fight, you make him fight. Go out there and beat him up. So then I went out there with more of an effort to hit him and, and beat him up. And then, you know, Mills Lane, uh, my favorite ref, stopped the fight. Stopped the fight and said, you know, he wasn't able mentally to finish it. Well, you've become a hero here and certainly a real sporting hero, but so was Frank Bruno in a different way. And you go on to fight Big Frank, uh, first time that uh, an all-British WBC heavyweight title fight. What did you make of Frank Bruno? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Frank Bruno was, um, I would say he was, he was the old and I was the new. And he was revered and loved by everybody in Britain at the time. And they really uh, were backing him, r really behind him, and felt that you know he was their man. And I was saying, you know, he was their man. I am their man, and uh, I'm the, I'm the new. Uh, and I didn't think he uh, had the talent to uh, to to box with me in the sense that I felt that I was better than him. And it was it was uh, one of those times where all of a sudden we had to get together and prove who was supposed to go ahead and win uh, the world championship and, and, and show the world who was the best boxer in the world. Because Frank, when he got caught, used to sort of look as if he froze a bit, this fight in Cardiff, did, did you really believe, I'm definitely going to win this if I'm careful? Yes, I did. I felt that, you know, um, I had a better jab than him. I had a better right hand than him. And he actually shocked me in that fight because uh, I, it was a situation where either I wasn't warmed up enough or he came out very warm. But uh, seeing, seeing him in the, on the TV, you know, I'm looking at him and saying, I can beat this guy, you know, oh, he doesn't have a good job, he's not fast. But being in the ring with him is a lot different. Uh, he came out and he was beating me to the jab, he was hitting me to the jab, I was like, you know, that surprised me. This guy was better than I thought. And then as I warmed into the fight, I got a little better and um, I came out, he hit me with a jab and I just got mad and it's like I came out with a left hook and I hit him. And when I hit him with a left hook, he kind of did a, a funny wobble, he wibbled. And then that's when I really had that killer instinct and went in there and I started throwing punches and, you know, afterwards I looked at the fight and I hit him with 15 unanswered punches. And I realized that he's got great balance when he's hurt because he wasn't falling down, but he was taking the shots. So um, you then start having skirmishes with Don King. You had a lot of legal su suits with him, and, and you won most of them, didn't you? you yeah. Won uh, all of them? Four no, of every one. Every one. Every one of the legal suits. One of them was a £4 million settlement. This was over Tyson. Yes. Why wouldn't Tyson fight you? Well, Tyson... He did eventually, but yeah, on this particular occasion. T Tyson, as I, as I realized, he never liked boxing big guys. You know, he had a fear against boxing big guys. And he felt that he, Evander, Evander Holyfield would be a lot easier than I was. And he was definitely wrong about that. Uh, you know, he, he boxed Evander Holyfield and, and lost and uh, ended up having, you know, a bite earring situation. And now I'm thinking, ah, oh, there goes our fight, you know. So um, he showed that he didn't really want to fight me, but he was almost forced to fight me because, you know, everybody wanted to see that fight between Tyson and Lennox Lewis. You know, every time I got my hair cut, that was, that was always <laughs> going to be the argument. Tyson's going to win. Tyson's better because this reason. Lennox is better because this reason. I'm thinking, I don't want to retire without facing this guy. So in history, all of a sudden, that was the fight that never happened and you know nobody would know who would have won so it was important for me to know who was going to win i mean if you look nowadays this is a situation between 
uh, Floyd uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao. They're never going to have the fight. And there's always that argument that's going to live forever. You know, who would have won? I had to answer that question before I retired. And you did, yes. because you beat Tyson. You knocked him out or stopped him in eight rounds. But what a strange man you must have found, Tyson, because he bit you on the leg in the press conference. Yeah, he bit me on the leg. Like I said, you know, um, after the World Junior Championships in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic in 1983, you know, the American team was saying, yeah, you know, the reason why I won was because Tyson wasn't there and his trainer, Custom Mother, wouldn't allow him to take a plane and they don't like taking planes. I'm saying, okay. Me and my trainer, uh, Arnie Beam, took a car and we drove up to the Catskills and said, who is Tyson? Where is he? We want to spar with him. And Tyson was very nice to me and he, sh he you know, uh, showed, showed me his room. He had a, a sheet cloth in his room and a projector. And he showed me some old fights I've never seen in my life. And uh, it was very interesting being up there. And even the first time sparring with him, it was, um, you know, we stepped in. I'm thinking, okay, we're going to work together and, uh, you know, we're, the, we're, we're basically the same. But he came rushing across the ring and he was trying to, you know, almost kill me, you know, threw some serious punches at me. And I was like doing, obviously, my Muhammad Ali uh, situation again where I was moving around the ring, moving and throwing the jab and keeping him away from me and using up the ring. And uh, that was the first time that uh, me and him even sparred. What sort of state was Tyson in as a boxer when you beat him? I would say um, he was, he was, he wasn't, he, he wasn't a hundred percent because of the fact of, uh, I, you know, he hasn't improved any. Uh, my main uh, focus was looking at the Buster Douglas fight. I saw all I watched, the Buster Douglas fight. And then I looked at the fight and I realized he hasn't gotten better, he's gotten worse. And even the fact that he's been incarcerated, you know, he hasn't had that time to improve. He hasn't, in, hasn't boxed anybody to improve. So I wouldn't say he was 100%. The Holyfield fight, Evander Holyfield twice against Lennox Lewis, would you say they were the most famous fights? Uh, I would say they're pretty famous because a lot, you know, a lot of people, especially in America, always, you know, say they call me Holyfield. I'm like, why do people call me Holyfield all the time? I think because of the fact that they've seen me in Holyfield box a couple of times, yeah. and uh, and they compare me to him, or I don't know what it is, but uh, you're asking if they were were famous fights, pretty famous. Uh, famous in the sense, if you ask Evander Holyfield who won the first one, he said, well, he did because that's what the judges say. And I'm saying, come on, admit it. You know I beat you. You weren't, uh, when, when you left the ring, you were in pain. I passed you on the wall throwing up. So uh, you knew I, I beat you at that time. And even the second fight where we came together, I would say it was a lot closer than the first fight. It was a better but, fight. Yeah, it was a better fight. But if, when you look at the scoring, scoring had me miles ahead. Well, I was at ringside for both of them, actually. In the first fight, you threw three, 348 punches. Holyfield threw 130. And a woman judge, Eugene Williams, said that Holyfield um, threw more punches, uh, and she gave it to him by two points. Larry <laughs> O'Connell, the British judge, had it level. And Stan Christodoulou from South Africa, who refereed the McGuigan Pedroza fight, yeah. who's a great judge, he actually had you winning. And I think most of us at ringside who yeah. studied the fight had you winning that yeah, first I couldn't, time. I couldn't understand the uh, British judge at that time. Like, how do you have it even? I mean, I'm going like this in the last round. The British crowd is cheering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I felt good about it. And, uh, you know, if you ask the uh, Eugenia Williams, what happened in the fight? She said she couldn't see because the ref was in the way. How can a judge oh, say that? Me. You know, they she get has the best the, position of, in the, the whole view. fight. Yeah. And uh, the, the return at the uh, uh, Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas, uh, there weren't so many punches thrown, even though it was a really great fight. But you won that one, and this time the judges had were unanimous. Mar yeah, they had me miles ahead. So did you feel relieved that this time the judging was right? Well, the interesting thing about it is, it's like. Fighting another fight, the same fight again, it's like I won the first fight and, you know, the second fight, I was really kind of going through the motions because, I, you know, I, know, I knew what it took to beat Evander Holyfield and what it would take. 
and basically, you know, I'm a better boxer, just use the attributes that I have. When people say, oh, you were losing the fight on points, I'm thinking, I wasn't fighting the fight to win points. I was trying to knock him out. Well, you became un undisputed world champion. Um, what was your lifestyle like now? Was it changing? Was, was life changing for you? I mean, you're now in the, in the multi-million dollar bracket. Life changing for you? Uh, yeah, to a certain degree. Um, you know, um, didn't change too much. You know, money doesn't really, didn't really affect me like that. You know, I still live the same life I did, still had the same friends, and, uh, you know, my, my feet were still on the ground. Materialistically, did you enjoy things? Uh, to a certain degree. Everybody likes to drive a good car yeah. and, uh, you know, like great clothes, but I, I never really went over the top. It's not like I had a whole bunch of diamonds and things like that. So, I, I, you know, my mother taught me to save money, so that's what I did. The second fight, the only other fight you lost in your professional career, career was against um, Harem Rockman. Now, you'd been filming, and I know you love acting and you've been in some movies, you were filming Ocean's Eleven with George <laughs> Clooney and that. Yeah. And, and you weren't, I think it's fair to say, 100% fit, which is unusual for you. Do you look back at that fight and say, perhaps I should have been better prepared? Well, everybody thought that, you know, going three days and just shooting a movie part really interrupted my training. It wasn't that situation, it was, that wasn't the situation. The situation was more the high altitude. Uh, South which, Africa. Yeah, in South Africa that really affected me because it really threw off my timing. And Hasim Rahman was uh, in South Africa a lot earlier than I was. And that was the first time I actually have ever fought at high altitude. And when I seen the smaller guys fight, they never missed a beat. They were just 100%. I'm like, the altitude's not even affecting them. You know, I walk up a flight of stairs and it's like, <sighs> I have to take a deep breath. Or even when I was sparring over there, it's like, I'm sparring and I have to come a step back and <sighs> take a couple deep breaths. And I was like concerned about that aspect. So that kind of threw me off. The ring threw me off as well. And, uh, you know, uh, Hasim Rahman threw an unbelievable punch, which I happened to have my chin in the way of. So uh, it was a great punch by his, his point of view, and uh, it hit me. And, I, you know, I look at that as you can't walk in the rain without getting wet. And that was uh, a part where I got wet, and I didn't really recover like I did, and the referee again stopped the fight. But I knew the mistake before I even stepped out of the ring. So I knew that he didn't really beat me. He threw a punch, a lucky punch. And a lucky punch is a punch that's thrown one time and connects one time. Looking back, though, Lennox, on that particular fight, would you say that you'd have changed things differently in hindsight? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and it's, it's interesting. i got to tell you this part. After every one of my losses, a lot of the people that were on the boat jumped ship. And even in the second... Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, like, for instance, um, the f uh, first loss against um, McCall, McCall uh, my trainer, Pepe, jumped ship. Oh, he, he knew he, that was his job, and he basically quit at that time. Uh, the second f fight where I lost, you know, it was basically my manager, Frank Maloney, jumped ship. And then all of a sudden started saying, oh, well, you know, doesn't know if I'm going to go back into boxing. He was doing, he was doing uh, interviews before I did interviews, saying that, oh, he doesn't know what I'm going to do now and everything. So, um, you know, with every loss, somebody's going to jump a ship. So, you know, that's telling other boxers out there, be careful, you know, make sure that people with, are with you 100%. So you became self-managed then? Yes. And you're much wiser. You've been winning lawsuits. You've seen boxing inside out. You felt more comfortable, presumably, and, and, and felt a lot happier about commanding your own future. Yeah, very important to command your own future. And, you know, you have to learn a little bit. You have to go through the ups and downs before you wake up and realize there's, uh, there's certain ways you should do things to really uh, help yourself, and uh, it's going to be for your credit. You always had a lot of dignity, apart from 
the return with uh, Rockman, when you did an American studio interview and finished up brawling with him, I think there were suggestions that he made that you were gay <laughs> at the time. I mean, for the record, you are happily married with two lovely kids. But, yeah. um, you know, there were suggestions. Why was he doing all that? Uh, I, he was trying to get under my skin. And uh, it was interesting because uh, he tried to get under my skin. I got a, under his skin. You know, he made a suggestion. I said, ah, I think you should ask your sister if I'm gay or not. And he goes, what? What did you say about my sister? And, that, and that's when we kind of uh, got into a tangle. That was, that was a very interesting time. But when you finished up in that tangle, that was, uh, you'd handled Tyson biting you on the leg in a press conference. That, that was not quite Lennox Lewis, was it? No. Uh, it's interesting because I've never been bit on the leg by another human or even bit. And when I seen that, I was in shock. And then I realized that, you know, maybe this guy's trying to get out of the fight. So I said to myself, you know, I'm not fighting him, not fighting him. And uh, then he said, then I heard that, uh, you know, he turned into a vegetarian and everything like that. So I said, okay, I'll fight him now. He's not, he's not meat hungry. He's not <laughs> going to bite me in the middle of a fight or something like that. And as usual, you won the return against people who'd, uh, well, only two people beat you. You won, you won the return, which yes. is... Yes. And became only one of, one of three boxers, heavyweight champions, to win the title three times. Yeah, uh, you know, to get it back. Yeah, and after every loss, people always said to me, "Well, what are you going to do now?" And I'm thinking to myself, "Muhammad Ali lost three times. He can't. He was able to come back three times. Why can't I do it?" What's the feeling within boxing about your performance? Do you think your status as as world champion? I think um, you know, and I said it when I retired. You know, you know, people won't realize it it'll take time and it's, it's like fine wine you know my status is gonna get better with time when you fought your last fight against Vitaly Klitschko he was actually leading on points after uh, five rounds and he had a terrible cut um, how did how did you f react to, to that win did you think at one point you were going to lose at last no I mean it's interesting because I wasn't really fight when you know in a fight you know you go into a fight and you, and mentally you know what you're going to do ahead of time for for that particular fight I felt that you know this is going to be my last fight and I wanted to fill it f finish it with style he was basically going to be the icing on my cake and um, I said that I wanted one let's go for lunch and the other one for brunch and, um, you know, boxing uh, tall Vitali was very awkward for me, uh, and I wasn't really prepared to box him at that time. This is a year after fighting Tyson. And, uh, you know, Tyson's a lot shorter than him and weighs a lot less. So all of a sudden, you know, HBO was saying, ah, oh, yeah, take, take this date, it's open. Uh, please take the date, you can beat him easy, and then you can go and retire. But I realized that this man was preparing for me for a whole year. While I was resting, he was still training and preparing for me. And I was supposed to box Kurt Johnson mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year. And then I said I would box him at the end of the year. It kind of warm into my, the fact that I was resting. And I, I took him a bit early and uh, took him a 10 days notice. Uh, had about four rounds of sparring with a, a six foot eight guy. So I was really adjusting in the fight while I was fighting uh, Vitali, And, uh, you know, I always say, when people say, oh, you were losing the fight on points, I'm thinking, I wasn't fighting the fight to win points. I was trying to knock him out. And in boxing, you have to, if, you, if you're going to be great in boxing, there's a couple of things you have to know. You have to be good on the inside. You have to box well on the outside. You have to have, to have a great chin. You have to have good endurance, and you can't cut. You can't. Your skin can't cut because uh, what happens is your skin gets cut. You start bleeding, and then all of a sudden you lose confidence. The blood gets in your eye. With uh, Vitali's case, he had five cuts around his eye, and you know, although I wanted to knock him out in the in in the in the fight, I didn't want to blind him. I didn't want that to be my legacy, blinding you know the next. Uh, next great boxer. So in, in essence, I think the referee did a good job with stopping the fight. 
Al Galvin was your cuts man, very good cuts man. Yes. But I can't see any marks. I don't think you suffered from cuts, did you? Only one, one time Evander Ho that? Holyfield headbutted me. Right. And, you know, and I'm like, ah, the two cuts I got was from headbutts, and it was Evander Holyfield. And I said, boy, and this, people always ask me, do you feel bad about that? I said, well, not really. I, I don't mind getting a cut, and, you know, the reward was uh, millions of dollars after that, so it was good. Often boxers retire and then come back or get the retirement wrong. Did you make up your mind before the Klitschko fight that you were retired or was it afterwards? No, it was actually before uh, the fight. And, um, you know, it's interesting because people say, well, why didn't you come back and fight Klitschko? I'm thinking, this guy never said that he wanted to eat my children. This guy never, you know, disrespected me. He's a lovely guy. You know, all of us, you know, all I know is that I gave him an opportunity to uh, take the titles. He wasn't able to. And, uh, you know, I don't have that hunger again. You know, my hunger is to go on with the rest of my life. Were you ever tempted to come back? Oh, yeah. I was tempted. You know, uh, what I would do, I would, um, at nighttime, I would dream about me coming back and taking my title again. And then when I wake up in the morning, I would talk myself out of it. You're financially secure. What was it? Was it the lure of the spotlight? Was it the lure of success? What, what was it that made you dream about those things, do you think? Just, you know, it, what, what it was was everywhere I went, people were saying, you know, we miss you in boxing. When are you coming back? You're still young. Please come on. And then I would look in history because history was my key to the future. And I realized all the boxers that came back never really did as good as they did. And the reason why they came back was because of money. Something that, you know, I didn't need, I never needed at that time. So the lure of getting back in the ring wasn't really money, wasn't the glory, I had that already. And, uh, you know, I've basically been there and done that. I've, I've accomplished my, all my goals. And I said before I, I, I left boxing that I would get rid of all the misfits in boxing, and I did. What's the best advice you'd ever give anybody who's been in your position? Um, that uh, believe in yourself, don't listen to anybody else, don't read bad press, and, uh, and realize the sacrifices involved and that it's lonely at the top. Was that advice you were given or something you worked out yourself? Uh, no, I worked it out myself. I worked it out myself. I mean, I was given advice all through my career, but you know, those are the ones that really stood with me. And was is health should be a uh, future health should be an issue as well, shouldn't it in boxing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because here's here's one part that I realize in boxing: the guys that lose weight all the time. You know, they gain ten pounds, then they lose ten pounds and go in the ring before the fight. That's not healthy. That's the bad part about boxing. So what do you miss, Lennox, after such a fantastic career? What do you miss about not being in the ring? What do I miss? Uh, nothing. I'm kind of glad nobody wants to take my head off all the time. <laughs> you know, every time I beat somebody and I come back and I sit on my throne, three guys are calling out my name saying they can beat me and I uh, get off my throne again and come beat them and come back and sit down. There's always guys out there to, to beat you. So I'm kind of glad in, in one sense that I've retired. Now, that's left up to somebody else. Whoever has the title right now, that's what they're dealing with. If you had one moment to put above all others in your career, what would it be? Uh, what would it be, one moment? Well, since we're in the Olympic aspect of, of, of the era, I would say my Olympic gold medal was, was very important for me. And it was, um, you could say, the gold ticket into the professionals. and. Uh, is something that I would always remember because, like I said, my hero before me was Muhammad Ali, and he won the Olympics, and now I, I won the Olympics, and now it's, uh, now it's time for maybe my son or my daughters to win the Olympics at some sport. Muhammad Ali, your sporting hero, um, what was so fantastic about him for you? For, for me, was the fact that you know, not only was he a tremendous athlete, he was able to transcend everything he said and do it in the ring. He was able to stand up for his beliefs. He was able to uh, and and believe in himself so much that, you know, all the naysayers out there, uh, he, 
it didn't affect him. So I love that about Muhammad Ali. Well, the young lad from East London who went to Canada has certainly made a mark in sport, and uh, it must have been an amazing journey for you as well, Lennox. It was, and I, you know, I have to thank God and uh, everybody that helped me along the way. Well, you're certainly a sporting hero, and uh, thanks for sharing those memories with us. Thank you.